Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 10, shall we? Isaiah chapter 10. Uh, you'll recall that chapters 7 through 12 deal with a series of prophecies often referred to as the deliverance prophecies, dealt are given primarily toward the southern kingdom of Judah. And these prophecies were to assure Ahaz, the 12th king of Judah, that God would deliver them if they got right, if they turned back to God. Well, Ahaz didn't believe, so God gave him a sign. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It was a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child and call him Emmanuel. Ahaz still didn't believe, so God sent another sign in Isaiah 8, 3, where Mrs. Isaiah was to have a second son whose name translated means quick to the spoil, run to the plunder. In other words, you're going to be victorious. Don't worry, God is going to deliver you. However, we do know in a parallel passage in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 7 and on, that Ahaz didn't listen to God. He hired Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of the Assyrians, to come help him, and he did, but he turned on him and began to attack him. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. And I guess the idea is it's always best to listen to God. Amen. Okay, that was weak. <laughs> well, this brings us to chapter 10, verse 5, through chapter 12, verse 6. Now, in this section, Isaiah gives us a huge contrast. He is going to contrast the great Assyrian kingdom in chapter 10 to the great millennial kingdom in chapters 11 and 12. So first of all, let's drop back and look at this great Assyrian kingdom, the empire of Assyria in chapter 10, and it all involves and revolves around God. And we would mention six things in this section that involve God. Number one, the first thing we see is Assyria is used by God. That's in verses 5 and 6 here in chapter 10. Assyria is used by God. Take a look. In verse 5 of Isaiah 10, it says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation, speaking of Judah, and against the people of my wrath, my own people, and I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now, the northern kingdom was already in bad shape. They had fallen into idolatry, sexual immorality. They had turned from God. And so God was going to use this great Assyrian kingdom, these Assyrian soldiers, to bring Israel into captivity. Now, the Assyrians would be the rod of God's indignation. God was going to use the Assyrians to teach Israel a lesson. And that, of course, happened. In 732 B.C., the attack of the northern kingdom uh, came about under Tiglath-Pileser III. Subsequently, it was continued under Shalmanazar and then concluded in 722 by B.C. by Sargon II, the king of Assyria. So Assyria is used by God, verses 5 and 6. Number two, Assyria boasts against God. That's in verses 7 through 11. Assyria boasts against God. Take a look. In verse 7, it says, Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is, it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. For he says, are they not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish? And is not Hamath like Arad, cities in that region? And is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose cars whose uh, carved images excel, excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Now the king of Assyria was boasting about all his conquests, these various cities that we mentioned. And the idea is, hey, their idols didn't help them 
What makes you think that your idols, Jerusalem, are going to help you? But the king, of his, the king of Assyria didn't understand one thing. That it was God who was using him. It was God who was directing him. And it was God who was in charge of him. And this points to and speaks of the sovereignty of God. Question. Did God use Assyria to punish Israel and subsequently lay siege to Jerusalem? Oh, yes. He used them in a big way, to be sure. Was Assyria a pagan, ungodly nation? Absolutely. No question about it. And that points to the fact that God is even in charge of those who are evil. Okay, now that should bless the socks off all our stinky little feet. Look, when we look at the evil in the world, we think, oh my, terrible, tragic, and it is. But we think, God, where are you? God, what's happening? How can you, you know, follow me? Now, we don't do that, but people at other churches who are less mature than us. <laughs> but it really points to the importance of the fact that God is on the throne. God's in charge of even evil. Read the book of Job. You remember when God's in heaven and here comes Satan beeping along. He says, hey, where have you been, Satan? Oh, I've been to and fro. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He goes, oh, yeah, I'd love to attack him. But you got this hedge of protection around him. He says, I'll tell you what, let me remove the hedge of protection. Have at him. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> is God not even in charge of evil? You, you bet he is. And that should bring great peace and great rest to all of our hearts. You know, Ephesians 1.11 says that God is working all things according to the counsel of his will, whether we like it, understand it, agree with it or not. <laughs> I added the last part. <laughs> but for you and I, this is amazing. Well, let's come to the third thing in our study, dealing with this great Assyrian kingdom. The third thing we see is Assyria is punished by God. Number three, Assyria is punished by God. That's in verses 12 through 14. In Isaiah 10, 12, it says, Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, speaking of using the Assyrians to even attack them, that he, God will say, I will punish the fruit of of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, by my strength, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. I also have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand is found like a nest, the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there is no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth with even a peep. <laughs> Here we see that God uses the Assyrians to punish Israel or Jerusalem, but God subsequently will punish the Assyrians. You say, well, wait a minute, Clark, that's not fair. Didn't God cause the Assyrians to punish Jerusalem? Oh, yes. So why on earth would God punish the Assyrians? Well, according to verse 12, it's because of his arrogant heart and his haughty looks. We call it pride. You know, six times the king of Assyria says, I, in verses 12 through 14. Three times he says, my. <laughs> in other words, I've done all this all on my own. Fact of the matter is, God used him to do it. And I think the life lesson for us is pretty powerful because when God chooses to use us to do a work for him, we need to be careful. There's a real danger there in thinking, well, you know, I mean, God's pretty smart. It's no wonder he chose me. I mean, after all, I'm so talented, so smart, so handsome. Are you kidding me? 
Listen, God uses rocks and donkeys. It's a miracle he uses any of us at all. But he does. And when God chooses to use us, we need to be careful not to become haughty, to become arrogant. We call it pride. Thinking that somehow, well, yeah, you know. You know, apart from God, there's no hope whatsoever. In fact, in fact Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It has nothing to do with us. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do a few things. Oh, no, excuse me, he didn't say that. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing whatsoever. We are helpless and hopeless apart from Christ. Okay, three of you think so. Look, when we stop thinking that way, that's pride on our part. And when that happens, just like the Assyrians, there's going to be punishment. Number four, let's come to the fourth thing, and that involves the fact that Assyria is a tool of God. Assyria is a tool of God. That's in verses 15 through 19. In verse 15... God speaking, he says, shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up. Or as if a staff could lift up as it were, as if it were not wood. Therefore, verse 16, the Lord, the Lord of hosts will send leanness among the fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruited field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of the forest will be so few in number that a child may write them or a child may literally count them. And the point here is pretty simple. A tool can do nothing without the person that uses it. It just sits on the workbench. It's only a tool. It's virtually worthless until somebody picks it up and begins using it. And here the Assyrians, who were a tool thought they were better than God who was using the tool. And since they boasted of the fact that they were greater than God, hey, God said there is going to be punishment. And in fact, there was. There was great punishment. After the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity, in 701 B.C., the Assyrians laid siege to Jerusalem. It began uh, with Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. He had brought the vast Assyrian army to surround the walls of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us he had 185,000 soldiers. So the people inside the walls of Jerusalem, man, their situation looked hopeless. The people felt helpless. They thought this is the end, but it wasn't the end because according to 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 35 and on, and as we'll see in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36, God sent one angel. You all remember the story? God sent one angel and he killed in one night 185,000 Assyrians. Hey, angels are bad dudes. I'm not sure who are angels. God sends angels, and, and sometimes they come in human form. And, and this is really a great reminder for us to be nice to everybody. I mean, could you imagine ticking off an angel? <laughs> You're done. <laughs> now, this brings us to the fifth thing we want to look at. We said there were six in this first section. Number six, or number five rather, I like this one. Assyria doesn't destroy all the people of God. Assyria does not destroy all the people of God. In other words, there's going to be a remnant. Look at verses 20 through 23. 
in verse 20, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, the Assyrians, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all of the land." Now, even though the Lord caused the Assyrians to invade and capture Israel, the northern kingdom, the point is God will always leave himself a remnant. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 9, also in Romans chapter 11. And it really points to the importance of two things. Number one, that God's covenant with the nation of Israel is an eternal covenant covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. And unfortunately, there are many today in so-called Christian churches and various denominations who believe in what's called replacement theology. They say that the church has replaced Israel, that Israel is no longer God's chosen people and God's chosen land. Now, the Greek theological term for that is balonia, yeah, baloney. Of course. Hey, listen, God will never utterly destroy his people. There will always be a remnant. And why is that important? Well, because according to Romans chapter 11, verse 17, you and I are grafted in. We're grafted in as a wild olive branch to the true olive tree. And what a glorious thing that is. Aren't you glad God never forsaked his people totally, that there's always a remnant? Because now we can be grafted in. So that's one important aspect of what's happening here. But the second thing, and, and for you and I, a real practical application point, is that the children of Israel were no longer to, to rely upon Syria they were to rely upon God. It's a simple lesson. It's a familiar lesson. But boy, it is an important lesson. Because I fear oftentimes we have a tendency to rely on our own strengths, our own power. We rely, rely on our own checkbook. We rely on our own smarts. We rely on our friends, our neighbors, our family, our loved one. We rely on, well, just about everything and everyone other than God. And God wants us to rely upon him. And I find it so interesting that we totally rely upon the Lord for our eternal life, do we not? I mean, we don't rely on anything or anyone else to get to heaven. We rely solely on God. And yet, <laughs> we forget to rely upon God for what's on our plate tomorrow morning. For what's facing us this week as it pertains to life in general. Wow. Well, let's come to the sixth and final thing in dealing with this great Assyrian kingdom in chapter 10. And that involves the fact that Assyria is conquered by God. Number six and finally, Assyria is conquered by God. That's in verses 24 through 34. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 24... It says, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion or Jerusalem, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. Absolutely, the Assyrians did begin their siege on Jerusalem in 701. For yet a very little while and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock at Horeb. You remember in, Je in Judges 6 and 7, uh, the slaughter of the Midianites. So will he lift up in the manner of Egypt, verse 27. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. The, the siege of Assyrian, the yoke of oppression on Jerusalem is going to be lifted by God. 
He, verse 28, has come to Aath, or Ai. He has passed Migron at Michmash. He has attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Geba. Rama is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. In other words, the Assyrians are surrounding the entire area. Lift up your voice, verse 30, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish, or the city of Dan, Laish, up north in the northern region. Madmina has fled. The inhabitants of Gebim seek refuge. As yet he will remain at Nob that day, about five miles north of Jerusalem. He will shake his fist at the mountain of the daughter of Zion. In other words, the Assyrians are going to lay siege to the entire area and subsequently culminate there in Jerusalem on the hill of Jerusalem. Verse 33, behold, (laughs) behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. In other words, Assyria is going to get theirs. Oh, yes, God used them to lay siege to the north and the south. But, but... Because of their pride, because of their arrogance, God is going to lay siege to them. And as we've already mentioned, as Sennacherib began this onslaught on the Mount Zion or Jerusalem, as we mentioned in 2 Kings 19, one angel finished all of the soldiers in one night, and God was victorious. Well, this brings us to the contrast. We've looked at the great Assyrian kingdom. Now, in chapters 11 and 12, we have the great millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year rule and reign of Messiah on the earth. You remember at the end of seven years of tribulation, the first the church is raptured, seven years of tribulation. At the end of that seven years, Christ comes back to the earth. He judges the nations, Revelation 19.15, Matthew 25.32, And then he will establish and set up his millennial kingdom or the 1,000 year rule and reign of Christ on earth. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Now, this section, chapters 11 and 12, deal with the Messiah and this millennial kingdom. And we would mention five things, and they go very quickly. Number one, the first thing in this contrast deals with the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah. Look at verse 1. This is a familiar section. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, like Assyria and Israel, they were cut down, but uh, uh, Israel will grow back. How? How? There's going to be a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of its roots. Now, the stem of Jesse. Jesse, of course, was the father of King David. And this points us back to 2 Samuel chapter chapter 7, verse 16, that talks about the eternal kingdom of David and how the Messiah, of course, will come out of the Davidic line. From the root of Jesse, his stem, his seed, his, his offsprings, if you will. We're going to see this again. And we saw, it, excuse me, we saw it back in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. We'll see it in Jeremiah 23, 5, Zechariah 6, 12, Revelation 5, 5. All these references point to the Messiah as a branch, which of course points to and speaks of Jesus Christ. So, number one, the coming of the Messiah. Number two, the second thing involves the ministry of the Messiah in verses two through five, the ministry of the Messiah. In verse two of Isaiah 11, it says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now stop right there. The Holy Spirit is going to come and rest upon the Messiah. It's mentioned in Isaiah 42.1, Isaiah 59.21, Isaiah 61.1. It's mentioned four times in the, uh, uh, the ministry of Isaiah. 
So the question is when? When did the Spirit come upon the Messiah or Jesus Christ? Yeah, at his baptism, absolutely. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Luke chapter 3, verse 22. When John baptized Jesus, when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit, Luke 3, 22, descended in bodily form like a dove, the Bible says, and alighted upon him. You say, well, Clark, why did the Holy Spirit have to come upon Jesus? Well, you guys have a lot of good questions tonight. Um, for many reasons. One, it was the, the, the beginning of his ministry on earth, we might say. It was really the, uh, the thing that started his ministry, practically speaking. But I think second, it also validated the ministry of John the Baptist as it pertains to water baptism. Which, by the way, next Wednesday, is next Wednesday the first Wednesday of the month? Yes. yes, it is. Next Wednesday, we'll, of course, have communion. We'll be out here. We'll have family communion. And we'll have baptism, like last month. It should be amazing. And Sally and I uh, did a video today. It's probably going to come out Thursday or Friday, a little email. So if you don't get an email... If you don't get the email that Sally and I sent out, call the church, email the church, and get on our mailing list because we send it out every, every couple weeks or so uh, with some updated information. And boy, we have some updated information. I, I can't say it on the internet, but you get the video and you can watch it. Now, there's another reason the Spirit had to come upon Jesus. And I think that's for you and for me. What do you mean? Well, I think Jesus set that example for us to show us the importance of our need for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. You see, the moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in us, Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, but we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us, like in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. For what? For empowerment. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the Holy Spirit's the, the power we need to be a witness to Jesus Christ. Well, this section goes on. Look at the middle of verse 2. Talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus or the Messiah, it says, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's a lot of spirit. <laughs> and I think John mentions this in John chapter 3, verse 34. He said that Jesus did not re receive the spirit by measure. In other words, he received the whole spirit. And boy, what a, a great picture that should paint for us. Because we don't receive the spirit by measure. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive all of the Holy Spirit for every aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We see that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. Paul said, we're filled with the fullness of God. Same thing in John 1, 16. It says, and of His fullness we've all received. So when we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not by measure, we receive the Holy Spirit for salvation but when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, also for power and, of course, for the exercising of the gifts of the Spirit, which are mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Now, this section goes on in verses 3 through 5. It says, His delight, the Messiah, is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked and that's not because he has bad breath <laughs> righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist man when jesus christ comes back to earth at the end of the seven years of tribulation Revelation 19.15 says he's going to rule and strike the nations with a rod of iron. He is going to judge the nations, those who are left behind to go through the seven years of tribulation. 
And in righteousness, he's going to judge and slay the wicked. And by the way, you and I are going to be with him. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says you and I are going to rule and reign over men and angels. Because in Philippians 3.21, we have a glorified body and we're going to come back to earth with Christ at his second coming. Now, this brings us to a third thing about the Messiah. And I like this one. Number three, it deals with life during the reign of the Messiah. What is life going to be like during the reign of Messiah for that 1,000 year period of time? Well, look at verses six through nine. It says in Isaiah eleven six, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lay down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The idea is they're going to graze together. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Verse 8, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth, the whole earth, shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a glorious time the millennial kingdom's going to be. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden during that thousand year period of time. And here we see an interesting parallel to you and me. Why? Well, because during the millennial kingdom, even the animals are going to have a changed nature. Their natural instinct is going to be reversed. They're all going to get along with each other. They received a new nature. Boy, does that sound familiar. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. We're a new creature in Christ. Man, when God sees us, he sees that new nature, if you will. He sees a reflection of Jesus Christ, as it were, in you and in me. Because we put on that new man, as Paul talks about in Colossians 3.10. Now, I find this very interesting that there are groups today who are all millennialists, preterists. They teach, and there are several churches here in town that teach this, they're all millennials. They believe we are living in the millennial kingdom right now. I mean, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pack, okay? <laughs> okay, you didn't have to aim in that one. But even I can read... And, and it's so obvious a child can understand this. I just don't. Oh. Number four. Let's come to the fourth thing we want to look at because we got to wrap this up. Number four involves the remnant of the Messiah. Number four, the remnant of the Messiah. Uh, that is in verses 10 through 16. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, it says, And in that day... There shall be a root of Jesse, or the Messiah, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from uh, Pathros and Cush, from Elam, Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. In other words, from the whole world, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Jesus said that in the, in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, verse 
31, how he's going to gather his elect from the four winds or the four corners of the earth. Verse 13, also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. In other words, it's going to be a glorious time. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. In other words, they're all coming back to Israel. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. Speaking of the uh, eastern side of the uh, river Jordan and, of course, the Dead Sea. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt with his mighty wind. He will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. Boy, talk about bringing back the diaspora, those who have left Israel, those who've been taken away from Israel. We see it all the way back in the book of Exodus with the Egyptian captivity, uh, right up through the Holocaust, quite literally. And we saw a great movement in the 19th century through the Zionist movement of Jews coming back to Israel. It grew in the 30s and 40s. And of course, in 1948, when Israel became a nation, there was a great influx of the um, the Olim, the Olim, the, the, the migrants who were coming back to Israel, the faithful, the remnant of God. And once again, just like with the Assyrians, God kept a remnant, so too he will at the very end. There will always be a remnant. Well, number five and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. The fifth and final thing involves the praising of the Messiah. Number five, the praising of the Messiah. In chapter 12, verses one through six, it says, and in that day, we're still talking about that same period of time, you will say, oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Now, the word Yah that's used here is a contraction, if you will, for our English word Yahweh. That's, we transliterate it into English, Yahweh, because there's no vowels in, he, in Hebrew language. There's only the, the pata and the kamats and the various dots and dashes that imply the vowel sounds. So we, of course, insert them. So in our English way of saying it, it's Yahweh or God. And anytime you see the word Lord all capitalized, <laughs> that's Yahweh or God Almighty. And it's mentioned twice here for poetic emphasis, if you will. Well, the idea in verse 2 is very simple. Only God can strengthen us and only God can save us. Verse 3, it goes on. It says, therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth, cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your Myths. Man, while this represents the, the, the period of the millennial kingdom where you and I will be praising and worshiping the Lord all day, every day for a thousand years in our glorified body, it really also points to a beautiful picture of how we should live our lives today. Because in every aspect of our life, worshiping the Lord, praising the Lord, Man, read Psalm 150, every verse. <laughs> Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you got breath? Okay, good, five of you. <sighs> then praise the Lord. It's all about praising the Lord, family. Why? 
Well, because he is the one that's strengthened us. He is the one that has saved us. And I got to tell you, as we apply that to eternal life, it certainly causes me to raise my hands and voice in praise and worship to God. But equally so when we apply it to our daily lives. Because whatever we're facing in life, God is our strength. God is our salvation. And we need to continue to put our trust in him. Not putting our faith in the world, but putting our faith in the word. And Lord, we are so grateful. What an incredible section of scripture, Lord. What (laughs) amazing prophecies looking forward to that period of time when we'll be with you. Ruling and reigning alongside of you. And lifting up our hands in worship to you. But Lord, until that day comes, help us just to be busy about your business here on earth. Letting our light shine so bright amongst the nations that people will see you in us when we go to work, when we go to school, at home, at play, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Lord, help us to be that example of what it means just to trust in you, knowing you're on the throne. Lord, you're in control of even the evil. So we thank you for that glorious truth. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The brothers, the sisters, the pastors, they'll all be up front to pray with you, to pray for you. And don't forget to get the email. We've got some great information and check the website for additional information on some of that stuff. And again, um, next Sunday night, we'll start at 6 o'clock. Remember, Sunday night, we're moving from 7 to 6. Wednesday night will always be 7, but Sunday night will always be 6, 6 p.m. Sunday night. A little easier to get home. You know, it'll be lighter. and It'll just be good. I think it'll be a good thing. And I can't say anymore. Okay. God bless you guys. I love you. (laughs) Have a great week in Jesus.